So I'll just briefly introduce uh, my co-authors uh, who have been working with me and have discussing the topic uh, for quite a while. Uh, George Heimpel, Nick Mills, Beatrice Moriti, Matt Thomas, Yubak Sisi, and Chris Vickers, and Chris is with us today. So let me just say a few words about how we defined biocontrol. So we basically distinguish between two slightly different ways of biocontrol, but obviously they are complementary. So the first one is the natural biological control. So that's basically uh, the naturally occurring ecosystem services provided by a healthy environment where no human intervention is required. And then we have the second element, and that's the applied biocontrol. That's what we call applied biological control. Those are basically the nature-based solutions that are delivered by human interventions. And uh, on this nice graph on the right side, that per, per put together by Nick Mills, you see that there we have a lot of different biocontrol agents, a very high diversity, and we also have lots of different modes of action of these biocontrol agents. Now yet, as we already discussed this morning, and uh, as we will probably also discuss this afternoon and tomorrow, um, the rate of uh, adoption is still very low in biocontrol, and also the, uh, the rate of uptake. And we've already heard about a number of reasons why that might be. I'd like to add an additional one. So we think that one problem that we have been facing in biocontrol is that we tend to focus uh, when we describe the benefits of biological control, that we tend to focus on the direct benefits from control of the target pests. So basically we say, okay, the natural enemy will control the target pests and maybe we can even demonstrate some sort of an increased crop yield, which was the ultimate reason why a biocontrol agent was released. However, there are numerous, potential numerous indirect benefits that are created through biological control, through indirect effects on organisms. And that obviously includes issues like reduced pesticide application, increased pollination, for example, improved human health, uh, 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 food quality, uh, but also a more resilient livelihood in areas invaded by invasive species. And we tend, and that's our uh, suggestion, we tend to neglect uh, and to overlook actually the benefits of these indirect effects of biological control programs. So one way we can try to kind of change from a more siloed to a more system level approach when we assess the benefits of biological control is to actually use the One Health approach. Now the idea of the One Health approach is actually an old one, but then about 20 years ago, um, this One Health concept became really popular. And initially, it was mainly driven by the issue of zoonotic diseases. So it was mainly human and animal uh, doctors and researchers, uh, human health researchers, who actually started to collaborate and to create added value by collaborating across disciplines. But today, actually, we use a much more unifying concept and definition of One Health. And the concept basically recognizes that the health of humans, animals, plants, and the environment are closely interlinked and interdependent. And I think it is this new definition which can help us in assessing how biocontrol actually provides benefits beyond the direct effect, for example, on a crop plant. So in 2022, uh, the quadripartite organizations, so FAO, uh, WHO, UNEP, and the World Organization on Animal Health, they published a joint plan for action, a joint action plan for uh, One Health, and they identified six uh, action tracks, basically, which they wanted to focus on over the five-year period of that report. So some of them focused on, on uh, zoonotic diseases. One was on capacity in One Health. There was one on food safety, one on antimicrobial resistance, and the sixth one was to better integrate the environment into the One Health concept. And now I'd like just to give you two examples um, how I think that we can actually benefit from this concept when we think about what are actually the benefits of biological control and vice versa, that we, as from the biocontrol community, can actually inform the One Health community on what the contribution of biocontrol is for One Health. 
And I'll take just two examples which are quite different, completely different habitats, completely different actors and stakeholders, and they also address different uh, action tracks in that joint plan of action. So the first example deals with aquaculture. Uh, this is probably the food sector with the fastest growth rate worldwide. And um, it is a huge market, but aquaculture is also challenged with a number of problems. And one of the major problems are obviously diseases. And in particular, bacteria, uh, one of these major strains of bacteria of the Vibrio species, they are very well adapted to marine aquacultures and ecosystems, and they uh, attack a number of different organisms rare in aquacultures, such as fin fish or shrimps. Now, when you look at the rate of, first of all, I should say that the main management of these bacteria is obviously the use of antibiotics. There is a huge amount of antibiotics which are put into water uh, as part of aquaculture production. And when you look at the key challenge, uh, the bacterial disease threat, this uh, multi uh, antibio antimicrobial resistant index is for many of the organisms in aquaculture is higher than 0.2 which means that these organisms which are rare in aquaculture are already resistant to about 20% of the antibiotics used in aquaculture. Now, there is actually a solution from biocontrol. And the use of fakes or bacteria fakes has been tested, has partly been commercialized, and is being used in aquaculture, but only at very low rates. There are multiple benefits. Obviously, the direct benefit of uh, ba bacteriophages is that it can reduce the parasitism of these bacteria, and it can significantly reduce the infection rates in aquaculture. And then it has, obviously, indirect benefits. So it actually reduces also the incidence of antimicrobial resistance and what they also showed, the spread of resistant genes. And ultimately, they also reduce the risk of infection uh, of humans. So there are multiple benefits, the direct benefit on the animals which are reared in aquaculture, but there are also indirect benefits um, that are provided by this biocontrol solution. But yet, uh, this biocontrol solution is rarely implemented. The other example takes us to uh, semi-arid and arid regions uh, of the world, in this case East Africa. So we're talking here about invasive tree species, and this is now related to the action track number six uh, of the Joint Plan of Action, integrating the environment into one health. And these invasive trees are of particular concern with regard to the main livelihoods in these areas, pastoralism, because they invade large areas of rangelands, uh, suppress the forage for livestock, and also directly injure livestock. So when actually the community in Kenya uh, sued the government, they brought an injured animal to the court and they actually won the case. But Prosopis is still there. They are biocontrol solutions, at least in one area in Western Australia, which actually has very similar climatic conditions as Rift Valley in, in Eastern Africa. Uh, this biocontrol agent, which is a leaf tying moth, has reduced seed production of this invasive tree species to almost zero. So it basically stopped the spread of this tree. It doesn't kill necessarily the established ones, the trees, but it stops the spread. So the main benefit of introducing such a biocontrol agent is that you can actually stop the invasion process. But there are a number of indirect benefits of managing prosopis by biocontrol and other management options. And I think that's something we need, again, to emphasize uh, uh, for, to make clear what the overall benefit is of biocontrol. So first of all, uh, these tree species are actually multiplying vectors of human diseases. So what we see is that in areas where these trees have established that both mosquitoes, which transmit malaria, sandflies, which transmit leishmaniosis, have outbreak densities, create outbreak densities. Um, it has been also experimentally tested in the case of, of mosquitoes, uh, malaria transmitting mosquitoes in Mali, 
where they could show that both the fitness of the adult, of, of the, the mosquitoes, but also the number uh, dropped by a factor of five when you removed the flowering shrub uh, uh, branches of Prosopis from a village. So clearly there, is, uh, there will be a very significant positive indirect effect of Prosopis management on human health. And the additional indirect positive effect is obviously water conservation or preservation. Prosopis consumes a lot of water. In, in the lowlands of, of Ethiopia, for example, Prosopis has already reached a level of invasion where it consumes half of the total rainfall in the region, thereby exacerbating the effect of climate change, which are already uh, occurring in that region. And it has been shown that management of prosopis again increases soil water level and, and thereby uh, preserves water in the ecosystem. And last but not least, obviously, there is also a very significant positive effect on biodiversity. When we combine all these elements, and we did that, and we came up with an economic assessment, the economic assessment of management of prosopis is huge. We are talking about several hundreds of million dollars for one region in Africa only. Now, maybe just a very short uh, step away. And uh, so I'm just asking the question, do we actually need biocontrol? Don't we have other solutions? And I'd just like to illustrate that here in the case of Prosopis in Kenya. This is an area in Baringo County in Kenya uh, where we mapped the distribution of Prosopis and we used satellite images to monitor the trajectory of the invasion over 30 years. And basically, we could, pay, we could look at every single 30 by 30 meter pixel at the landscape and we saw whether such a pixel has been managed by land users or it has not been managed over these 30 years. Now, what you see is the red color are all the areas where management has never occurred, although the people want to get rid of prosopis. And it's only these small areas along water where you have a single management event or continuous management of this invasive tree species. So you can easily imagine that management an invasive tree at the landscape level is not going to work if thousands of individual land users are supposed to take action at the same time. And that's where biocontrol comes in. Good, so I'll, let me just finish um, maybe with some take home messages here. First, I think there is a lot of benefit if biological control and the One Health communities come together and realize how much each of them actually can contribute to the other community. The One Health concept can help revealing the full range of benefits created by fire control uh, projects. And it also opens the opportunity, offers the opportunity to extend biocontrol application beyond the crop production system. There are lots of possible biocontrol solution with regard to animal health and human health. And in return, biological control actually has already solutions to some of the biggest global health challenges, including chemical pollution, biocide resistance, biodiversity loss, and habitat destructions. Here are just a few suggestions or ideas how we can actually realize the full potential of biocontrol, also considering this One Health context. And first, I think it is important that we conduct more rigorous evaluation of the direct and the indirect benefits of biocontrol, considering all domains of the One Health context. Then improve the economic assessment to take into consideration all costs and benefits to guide decision making and compare that with alternative scenario scenarios, including doing nothing. Then implement a diverse suite of hard and soft policy levers to support One Health, which indirectly also supports biological control then. And streamline regulatory mechanisms to facilitate adoption of biological control tools without compromising safety and efficacy. And last but not least, promote these transdisciplinary approaches involving stakeholders across the whole value chain. With this, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention.